Hello, everyone. I hope everyone has had a wonderful summer and a wonderful long Labor Day weekend. It's with mixed feelings that I welcome you back to our COVID-19 webinar series. Mixed in that we would all have loved to be able to put COVID-19 behind us, but we can't just yet. Until that happens, we've promised you that we'll continue to be by your side and provide you with the latest guidance and answer and any questions that are on your mind. Before we get started, please join me in congratulating our 2020 AbbVie IBD scholarship recipients. Each of the 10 recipients who live with Crohn's or colitis were awarded with a $5,000 scholarship as they head back to class at a Canadian post-secondary institution. We are very proud to be able to help these inspirational students from across Canada in fulfilling their academic journey. As the days get shorter and cooler, we can't help but wonder what's around the corner. We've been asked so many questions, including, will there be a second wave? When will a vaccine be ready? How can we protect our children as they head back to school? COVID-19 has forced us to make significant changes to our lifestyles and our social habits. Most of us have spent way more time with technology than we have with people. A recent survey by IMI International reports that on average over the last month, we met with 14 people in person for greater than an hour. We've been in our bubbles. So it's no surprise that at schools and workplaces reopen that there's concern. The IMI survey reported that almost 60% of Canadian parents are either concerned or tremendously fearful about their kids going back to school. What's driving this fear? Likely a lot of uncertainty. We hope that today's webinar will help alleviate some of these concerns by providing updated tips and guidance. As always, this information and the webinar recordings can be accessed on our website at Crohn'sandColitis.ca. Tonight is our 16th webinar. As I said earlier, we remain committed to hosting these webinars as long as you need us to be. We'll be holding monthly webinars and we will increase the frequency if needed. Alongside these webinars, we will be holding two Gutsy Learning Series events in October, one on the microbiome and the other on our GEM project. We hope you can join us. Crohn's and Colitis Canada believes deeply in our mission to cure Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and to improve the quality of life of children and adults affected by these chronic diseases. As always, please watch for our emails and at Get Gutsy Canada social media for updates. For those that joined our virtual 25th anniversary Gutsy Walk on August 23rd, a sincere thank you. The day, that day, we lit up social media. We loved seeing your photos and reading your stories. There is still time to help us reach our goal please go to gutsywalk.ca. We really need your help to continue funding our research projects. With that, a huge thanks to our task force who continues to meet to discuss policies and recommendations necessary for our community. Thank you to today's panelists, Dr. Michelle Science, Dr. Ann Griffiths, Dr. David Mack, and Dr. Remo Panaccioni. And of course, much appreciation to our fantastic moderators who have been with us from the very beginning. Dr. Gail Kaplan, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Calgary. He's an adult gastroenterologist and epidemiologist. He's the chair of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council, as well as Crohn's and Colitis Canada Board Director, and Dr. Eric Benjamal, who recently moved from Ottawa to Toronto, where he is now professor and pediatric gastroenterologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and University of Toronto, and North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, Nutrition, in short, NASPAGAN, Canadian Councillor as well as our Chair-Elect of our Scientific Medical Advisory Council. Thank you to our moderators and panelists. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Mia. Nice, Mia. It's a pleasure yeah, to be back. Yeah, absolutely a pleasure to be back. And, and Eric, I just want to also echo congratulations for moving from Ottawa to Toronto, taking a job at SICK Kids, being promoted to professor. It's been a pretty eventful summer for you. It has. It's. Uh, I've come back to the place I grew up. I've come back to be closer to family and it's uh, a wonderful move for everybody. So I, I'm uh, not easy to do during COVID, not easy to do during a pandemic, but we're making, we're getting by. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's so nice to be back on um, on online. I, I, I can't, this 2020 has gone by like a whirlwind in that period between March and June, I think was some of the hardest months, both professionally and personally I've, I've ever had. Um, and uh, while this summer has by no means been a normal summer, um, it was a, a little bit more normal than than the months that preceded it. So um, but now I feel we're back. Um, we're back doing these webinars. Um, Mina mentioned that we're going to be doing these once a month rather than, than weekly. Um, and so the key is to 
um, make sure we've got some great topics, listen to the questions that is coming in from the community, um, and we'll be, be advertising the future webinars that we do, like the next one we do in October. Yeah, and that's key. I mean, I think it's it's we're at a stage in the pandemic where weekly uh, not a lot is changing. That could change in the future, but what's nice to know is we're still learning uh, a huge amount and and our knowledge about this disease is increasing exponentially and luckily in canada uh until recently anyway the disease itself is not increasing exponentially we've done an amazing job flattening the curve and uh saying sort of physically distance and really making sure that we don't overwhelm the healthcare system so that's been nice to see over the summer okay. and for those who don't know both eric and i have um children that are all that are school age that are all going back to school in, in September or have gone back to school. Um, my, my kids started last week and really difficult choice that we had to make as a family. And I know that everyone who's watching this webinar is making the same critical decision. So we really hope that today's webinar is going to be um, educational and, and informational for you. Yeah, absolutely. So if I can take over the um, the screen, Sarah, I'll, um, I'll just kind of show um, the first slide and what, what I wanted to do with the um, 10 minutes that, that I have here and just want to make sure I can okay so everyone should should see that the first slide here um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we did back um, in the spring of 2020 and um, everyone remembers that on March 11th the WHO announced that um, that uh, the COVID-19 was a pandemic um, and we set up our, our COVID IBD task force which include adult and pediatric gastroenterologists, infectious disease specialists, nurses, patients, uh, representing every region across the country met on March 12th. Um, and we started to develop recommendations for the IBD community. Um, and then we asked the question, how do we communicate this information to you, the audience? Um, and, and this is what led us to develop these webinars. And we actually did 50 webinars from March 19th to June 25th. And I just want to spend two minutes just highlighting um, so those those webinars that we that we've done and the way to, to follow this slide is um, Here's the date of the first webinar. We did March 19th and on that date, the number of cases of COVID in the world was 230,000 um, The number of cases of COVID in Canada was 782 and the number of cases that were in the secure IBD registry and, and for those who don't know that the IBD registry um, is a, a international registry for individuals with IBD who have tested positive for COVID. Um, and you can see here as we go week by week, you can see the title of the webinar that we did. You can see how those cases um, have changed um, uh, from March 26th all the way up to June 25th. And on March 26th, we focused on pregnancy and IBD. On April 2nd, we talked about um, medications and their safety. Um, we talked about diet, nutrition, and mental health on April 9th. Uh, on April 16th, um, we had um, statisticians talk about modeling and projections. Uh, on April 23rd, we had the people who created the Secure IBD Registry talk to us about that database. On, on April 30th, we talked about telemedicine, the new way of producing um, clinics. Um, on May 7th, we had experts, uh, pediatricians from across North America, talk about um, uh, IBD in children. May 14th, um, Eric and I did a live Q&A session. On May 21st, um, we had IBD nurses talk about their perspective. Um, May 28th, we had a whole session dedicated on mental health during the pandemic. On June 4th, we talked about um, uh, washroom access and its safety. Uh, we talked about the IBD clinic of the future post-pandemic on June 11th. Um, and then on the June 18th, we talked again about medications and their safety. Um, and then lastly, on June 25th, our last webinar, we had Tim Caulfield, um, who was um, had a amazing presentation and answer um, period where he talked about myths and conspiracies related to COVID. And back on June 25th, you could see there were nine and a half million people across the world who were tested positive for COVID. So what do these numbers look like today? And, and this is data um, that was uh, downloaded uh, today. And, and again, I just also want to pause and thank Joseph Windsor and Stephanie Coward who have crunched numbers and helped me produce these slides um, so that we can show you kind of up to the date COVID information um, in the world and in Canada. And today on September 10th, nearly 28 million people have tested positive for COVID. Um, and uh, over 900,000 people have unfortunately passed away from, from COVID. Uh, if we look specifically at Canada, if you um, back on June 25th when we did our last webinar, there was 100,000 individuals who had tested positive for COVID. Um, and today in Canada, that number is about 134,000 people. 
um, of which uh, 9,000 people have, have died from COVID uh, in Canada since it started um, uh, back in March. Uh, if you look at where those 130,000 people are distributed across the country, you can see that Quebec and Ontario and, all, and Alberta have the highest number of cases. Now, if we standardize these cases for the number of people living uh, in the population, so the per capita numbers, so these are the cases per 100,000 people living in a province. Obviously, a province with more people are going to have um, more cases, but you can see Quebec here still continues to lead um, the nation in cases at 757 cases per 100,000 people living in Quebec. And these these numbers, these rates are equivalent to any hard hit country um, throughout um, the world. But you can see geographically across the country, um, other regions have done um, much better numbers are far less in the Maritimes. Uh, the, the next two hardest hit provinces are Alberta and Ontario. And in fact, for the, for the first time, Alberta's case per capita is actually higher than that of Ontario's. Um, if you look at outcomes, so this is uh, data from the Public Health Agency of Canada that was downloaded this week. Uh, and we were looking at uh, if you were tested positive for COVID, what were outcomes? And you could see that the majority of, of individuals in uh, Canadians who have gotten COVID remain mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, 7% um, died, about 8% end up in hospital. But these numbers differ by age group. And this is really important because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about risk at schools, risk to children who are attending schools, risk to teachers who are adults, um, and then also risk to grandparents. Um, and you can see that these risks are different by age. Uh, in Canada, virtually no child has died from from COVID and very few have ended up in hospital. The vast majority of children have had very mild asymptomatic disease. Similarly, the age of 20 to 59 year olds, and that's the age of most, most teachers who are teaching at schools uh, in Canada have also done uh, very well, including very low uh, number of deaths. But unfortunately, uh, and this data is consistent with what we see across the world, the group that is hardest hit are, are individuals who are over the age of 60, where, where the case fatality rate is upwards to 18% in Canada, 40% have been in, in hospital. So that's the group that, that we, we do need to protect the most. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some recent studies that have come out. Um, this one was uh, published in the British Medical Journal, BMJ, uh, and all talking about risk of transmission. I think that's a big part of what we're going to be talking about um, later on today and we, and we hear from our, our expert panelists, is what is the likelihood of being getting COVID if you're exposed to somebody who has it. Um, and this was a very um, uh, interesting paper, which defined risk based on factors that are happening to you or that are around you. So, and the way to kind of follow these tables is, what is the risk, whether it's low, medium, or high, if you're wearing a mask or if you're not wearing a mask? Uh, if you have a short contact period, you're only seeing somebody or in contact with them for a little bit of time versus prolonged period of time, like a, a, a full day in a classroom. Uh, and whether that space that you occupy with them is low versus high, low meaning you're able to physically distance for more than two meters, high meaning that you're crowded and you can't you can't get away from, from those individuals. And then if you're outdoors or indoors, and if you're indoors, is it a well-ventilated space or is it a poorly ventilated space? And then what are you doing? Are you just sitting there quietly or are you speaking? Are you singing? Are you physically active? And all of these factors change the, the risk profile. And, and we know that if you're um, looking at a scenario where you have short contact period of time, so um, you're walking uh, in a building, you're walking outside, uh, and you're, you're not spending a lot of time with the same person, the same group, the, the risk of transmission is relatively low, um, particularly in outdoor scenarios and particularly if you're wearing uh, masks. And if you're indoors and if you are able to physically distance, and you're in a well-ventilated space, the risks are, are small. Where risks start to increase is when you're not wearing masks, when you're in that crowded area, and particularly if you're indoors and indoors in, an, in a not poorly ventilated space. Now, of course, if you're spending more time with people, the risk of transmission does increase. So if you're spending a full day in a work environment or in a school environment, um, th those um, factors do, do increase. Um, and, and again, the key thing is, wearing masks um, and being able to maintain that physical distance. And, and if you're able to spend some of that time outdoors, that's going to be a lot safer than, than if you're indoors. And if you're indoors in an indoor area that's well ventilated, it's going to do better than a poorly ventilated one. And these are the factors that we think about in risk. And these are the factors that go into developing guidelines for schools, for workplaces, when we start kind of letting people going back into, into these environments. So I also want to just highlight 
um, one other study, the last one, uh, published in JAMA Internal Medicine, um, that looked about risk transmission in a bus. Now, this is a, an event that happened in China back in January, so well before you know we were doing any lockdowns or masks or anything like that. Um, but it, it's it's a a study that helps us kind of understand how things are, are transmitted. And this was a, an event in January where there were two buses of roughly we have 60 people that were in the bus for about one and a half hours and they were taken to an outdoor um, religious service. Um, and so the first bus had 60 people who were in the bus, spent an hour, one and a half hours, went to this religious service, intermingled with the other people in the other bus, and then went back home and none of them were affected with COVID. In the second bus, there was one individual that was um, symptomatic for, for COVID. And if you look at the at the at what happened to the people around that individual, you can start to see that there were cases um, of um, COVID and all the red spots were passengers who um, um, got COVID. And then the numbers here represent people that they then subsequently infected down the road. Um, and the key to this, this scenario was, this was a poorly ventilated bus. Everyone was crowded very close to each other. Obviously no one was wearing masks at this time because people weren't um, thinking about it at, at this point. And these are the factors that led to a high transmission rate, less so than the gathering that they had outdoors at this religious service. So again, these are the things that we're starting to think about. The, we start to understand what are the factors that are driving transmission and again and these are the same factors that public health officials are using to then create plans around safe going on buses safe going back to school safe going back to work so the last slide i want to do and i've done this with with each of the previous webinars is just update the numbers that we know uh, about um, ibd patients and so this is um, data from the Secure IBD Registry. Um, it's a registry of individuals who have inflammatory bowel disease across the world who have all tested positive for COVID. Um, this registry now has over 2,000 cases um, from, right, from all over the world, um, including 67 individuals who have died. And again, the numbers in the IBD population is very similar to what we're seeing in the general population, which is the people who are at the highest risk of dying, you can see this in this graph down here, are the our older population um, who um, who are above 80 in their 70s uh, in their 60s the, the risk is highest and, and we'll talk later on in the question and answer period about risk related to medications and, and any new information that we've learned about the IBD patient and about the medications over the over the summer so I'll stop there and I'll bring um, Eric back into the fold so he can talk a little bit about um, our recommendations for Crohn's and Colitis Canada uh, thanks, Gil. That's great. That's a very nice update. Um, and now I'm going to share my screen. Okay, great. Just make sure I share the right screen here. Perfect. Okay, so you should be able to see the uh, Crohn's and Colitis Canada website. And just to remind you, you can easily get to the COVID-19 information at crohnsandclitis.ca slash COVID-19, where it has all of our webinars here archived, the guidance documents, and some other information for you. Uh, under the guidance document is, uh, you know, the information about traveling, social distancing, all you're at risk, uh, all of the information from previous. And today we're going to highlight the reopening of schools and the economy. And this is really, these are the same recommendations as were present uh, before the summer uh, when we ended the web webinars in June. They haven't changed. Uh, we haven't met again as a, as a COVID-19 task force yet. Our first meeting back in the fall will be next Tuesday. But we did run this by the task force to ensure that they were happy not to change anything. And they, they felt that this recommend, these recommendations that we made back in, in May, June, are uh, valid today so that's good news in that we didn't get it wrong it seems like that the uh, the same evidence that we based our recommendations on back then nothing has changed there so you'll rem remember that the reopening of schools and the economy recommendations are really based on age group because of what Gil just said that really your risk of death and complications from COVID-19 is primarily based on how old you are so if you're a child an adolescent under 20 years old going back to school yourself. The real major message here is that if you have active disease, particularly severe active inflammation, your doctor says the disease is severe, or you're newly diagnosed, 
or you're on steroids, uh, at least 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day or 20 milligrams if you're above that, that limit, uh, or you have moderate or severe malnutrition, you really should be staying home from school at this point. And you should also be taking these precautions to ensure that uh, your child does not get uh, COVID-19 if at all possible. Um, however, if you are in remission, if your child is in remission, if, you're, if your child is not on steroids, if your child is well nourished and things are going well, then it is safe to go to school. And in fact, we recommended that you send your child to school because of all the things Dr. Science will, will speak about shortly uh, in terms of the developmental aspects, in terms of the mental health and psychosocial well-being of kids being back in school. The, the recommendations in adults are very, very similar. For adults, uh, in terms of reopening the economy, again, and, and, and being teachers, for example, or going into schools, uh, it's really inflammation, steroids, malnutrition, having other comorbidities that put you at risk for complications from COVID-19, like respiratory illness, like diabetes, like hypertension, and then being on uh, nutrition through your vein, uh, TPN, total parental nutrition or partial intravenous nutrition. And for seniors, uh, this is the group most at risk. And particularly as the numbers start to creep up again in most provinces of COVID-19, we recommend really continuing to self-isolate and socially distance if you at all can, and not entering schools and not entering large crowded areas. So none of these have changed. If they do change going forward, we will certainly let you know. Um, okay. So now we'll go back to the slides and I believe we have some poll questions for you. Uh, so you should be able to answer the poll questions either on your, your handheld device, your smartphone or on the web if you, if you are on the, uh, the desktop version of, of GoToWebinar. And Sarah, there we go. So just some information about you. How would you describe yourself? As an adult working in a school, a parent of a child going to school, a young person returning to middle school or high school, a student in university, college, post secondary school, or someone else? Okay, and we'll show the results. Uh, so, most of the audience are really parents of children going back to school, uh, with uh, also some adults who work in schools present, and, and the rest are other, presumably here for information in general for IBD, which is great. Uh, next question, uh, if you are involved with back to school, are you sending your children back to school essentially? So will your children go back online with e-learning, in-class learning, a mix of both, something else, so homeschooling or pods or something else, and or it doesn't apply to you? All right, shall we see the answers? So quite a mix, uh, certainly, but 45% are planning on sending their kids back in person. So interesting, with uh, another sort of 30, 35% mixing online, either in person online or online only. That's great, good. And I think we have one more question, we do not. So with that, I think we're gonna introduce Dr. Michelle Science. So Dr. Science is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at, the, at SickKids at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. She's also an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto and the Hospital for Sick Children. And she is also lead author of um, the Sick Kids report that many people have, will have heard of on uh, in the media and elsewhere. And you can Google it and you could read it yourself, but it's, just, it's called COVID-19 Guidance for School Reopening. And this was a report that was endorsed not just by sick kids, it was endorsed by multiple pediatric experts, uh, infectious disease experts, and uh, mental health well-being experts, as well as public health. And Dr. Science led that very famous initiative and is also leading a clinical trial looking at best ways of preventing infection in schools uh, in Canada. So thank you, Dr. Science, for joining us. We really appreciate it, and we will throw it over to you. Great, thank you so much for having me here today. And I, I hope you can see 
my screen there. Um, so I was asked to come back and come here today and, and talk to you about uh, COVID-19 and uh, implications for return to school. And as was already mentioned, I'm an infectious disease physician at SickKids. And uh, one of the areas that I work in is infection prevention and control. So I've been uh, involved heavily in the COVID response at the hospital and trying to prevent uh, uh, infections uh, and control spread within the hospital hospital. So I'm going to share a brief presentation with you and then I'll be available to answer some questions. Okay, so uh, you've already heard a little bit from Dr. Kaplan about the epidemiology and how that's been changing across uh, Canada. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the clinical features of SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the virus that causes COVID-19 infection in children, and then move on to briefly give an overview of how the virus is transmitted, uh, and then talk about how uh, schools have designed uh, the setting to mitigate the risk of transmission in those areas. Okay, so to start off, uh, we'll touch on the clinical features and how children with infection may present. And so while information continues to emerge, it's estimated that between 10 to 30 percent of children are asymptomatic. Um, children that do develop signs of acute COVID, their clinical presentation is often very similar to other respiratory viral infections. So they often have mild upper respiratory tract symptoms. So things like fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose, nasal congestion, uh, myalgias and fatigue. And with the return to school, this highlights the importance, the important role that testing will likely play uh, to rule in uh, or rule out infection. A minority of children can develop severe disease, so things like pneumonia uh, that may need admission to hospital or further support. Uh, Dr. Kaplan already shared this data with you, but in terms of uh, COVID-19 in children in Canada, so this data is a, a, as of September 9th, and so uh, you can see that overall there have been 11,356 cases uh, in children less than or equal to 19 years of age, which represents 9% of the total cases. Uh, but when you look at the, the data around severity, you can see that very few children, so 153 children, have been admitted to hospital across Canada, so that's around 1.3% of cases. In, only 30 have required admission to intensive care, so that's 0.3%. Uh, and then there has been uh, one death, uh, so that's a rate of 0.01%. And, and my understanding is that death was not directly attributable to uh, the virus. So overall, the data continue to support that the vast majority of children have mild disease uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So now I wanted to move on to uh, transmission. And there's a lot out there in the media that you see around how the virus is, is transmitted. And so as of now, there's really good epidemiologic data to support that the predominant mode of transmission uh, is by respiratory droplets uh, and exposure that occurs during close unprotected contact. You may hear of other modes of transmission, so fomite transmission, which essentially means uh, touching a surface and then touching one of your mucous membranes, which may lead to uh, transmission in that way, and then aerosol transmission, uh, both of which are really less common modes of transmission. And with respect to aerosol transmission, really the precise role uh, is unclear in the absence of an aerosol generating medical procedure. So aerosol generating medical procedures are procedures we do in hospital where there's manipulation uh, mostly of the airway that can generate aerosols and, and may lead to that form of transmission. But outside of that setting, uh, the role as is mentioned there is unclear. So I like this infographic from Toronto Public Health, which really describes the different way that COVID-19 can be spread and the different actions you can take to uh, help reduce the risk of transmission. 
So at the top left there, you can see with the green circle that the virus mainly spreads from close contact with an infected person when they cough, sneeze, or talk. So these are, are actions that generate droplets. Uh, and so if you're in close contact with someone, uh, it can potentially lead to transmission. So the action that you can take to help pr uh, protect yourself is really keeping that distance from others. Just below that, you can see in the blue circle that uh, people are most contagious when they are sick or in 48 and in the 48 hours before they show symptoms. And this is really where staying home uh, and self-isolating when you're sick uh, is, is a really important uh, strategy. And we'll talk about that in terms of one of the steps to, to reduce the risks in schools. At the top right there, that, that is a door handle for, for those of you trying to make up out what that symbol is. But this is to highlight that the virus can land on surfaces and survive for hours, but it's not really spread that easily that way. Uh, so there are recommendations, especially in school, around environmental cleaning. Uh, but really one of the main ways you can protect yourself uh, from this type of, from acquiring infection like this is good hand hygiene. So if you touch something that may be contaminated with the virus and then you uh, perform good hand hygiene, hand washing or, or hand sanitizer, that will help prevent transmission of infection. Uh, just underneath that, you can see that the it's just highlighting that the virus does not spread through the air. So building residents are not at greater risk from shared vents. Um, but as Dr. Kaplan also highlighted, if you are in um, a building in close proximity with uh, a large group of other people, uh, that can be a risk factor. So making sure you're keeping your distance, especially in common areas, can really help reduce the risk of infection transmission. And at the bottom there, you can see comments around masking. So masking or face covering uh, can help prevent others from your germs when used alongside all of these other very important infection prevention control measures, hand washing, distancing, and staying home when you're sick. And I'll talk a little bit more about face coverings or, or masks in, uh, in school and some of the considerations there. So is there any difference in transmission between children and adults? And again, this is another area that's really hotly discussed, uh, a hot topic of conversation in the media. And the bottom line is that yes, children can transmit SARS-CoV-2 similar to other respiratory viruses. But what's less clear is the role that children play uh, in driving outbreaks uh, and really propagating disease spread. And there is some early evidence to suggest that young children under the age of 10 may be less likely to transmit the virus. Uh, but a lot of this data is from uh, time periods when schools were closed. So we really need further data to get a better understanding of this. What has come out more recently is that teenagers do appear to transmit the virus at similar rates to, to adults. So the bottom line with respect to transmission in children is that they can transmit the virus, but how much they contribute to disease spread is still unclear and we need to study it further. But all of the health and safety measures that have been put in place in schools are under the assumption that children can transmit the virus. Um, and so with that, I'll talk a little bit about the risk mitigation uh, strategies that are being placed in school. Uh, well, actually, sorry, before that, <laughs> I'll just highlight uh, some of the school outbreaks that have been in the media. Uh, and just to emphasize that actually the majority of school openings have not been associated with outbreaks. Uh, so you often don't see the success stories in the news. And in situations where community transmission is low uh, and appropriate measures are in place in school, the majority or most of the school openings have actually been successful without outbreaks. Where you see a lot in the media is the situation uh, in the US, uh, and they're very different from us in Canada, uh, given the, the different epidemiology and the community spread that's going on there. Um, and then the other area that's received a lot of press is the outbreak in um, Israel. And a couple of points around that uh, was that with that outbreak, so the index cases came to school sick, uh, 
Uh, and there was really poor adherence with the recommended preventative uh, measures in the school. Uh, and then finally, just to highlight that all of those that were infected as part of the school outbreak were asymptomatic or had mild symptoms. So while these school outbreaks really uh, provide us with uh, some caut cautionary um, experiences, with the right risk mitigation strategies in place and low community transmissions, uh, schools can uh, be successfully opened. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, or I was asked to talk a little bit about the guidance document that was developed. And so Sick Kids, along with other pediatric hospitals, including uh, CHEO, McMaster, Kingston, Lenton, uh, Health Sciences, Unity Health, and Holland Bloorview in Ontario, uh, prepared some guidance around school opening. And really it was to get the conversation started around how schools uh, could start planning while awaiting ministry, public health, and school board direction. We had multidisciplinary input and really focused on the importance of maintaining low community transmission, as well as a bundle of interventions that could help to reduce the risk, acknowledging that the risk can't be entirely uh, eliminated. Uh, we used the hierarchy of controls, which you can see at the bottom there, which is from the CDC, and adapted that and identified a number of uh, health and safety measures, which are listed there on the left. I'm going to walk you through a couple of the measures, particularly the ones that families and students can help support in schools. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Uh, so the first is symptom screening and we need to make sure that symptomatic students and staff aren't going to school and that they get tested to confirm whether or not they have infection. This is really going to be critical to help prevent spread in classrooms. This screening can occur prior to arrival, on site or a combination and there are pros and cons to the different approaches that can be taken. Uh, and that's why public health units and school boards have implemented different processes, really adapting to their local context and their local situation. Uh, the screening tools are largely based on the Ministry of Health Symptoms, and you can see sort of the reference on the right there. And it's important to look to public health guidance around screening and the next steps should your child have symptoms. Uh, and I've included some links at the bottom there. Uh, the next important area of discussion is hand hygiene or washing your hands and this is really you know hand hygiene is really one of the basic infection infection and prevention infection prevention and control measures and studies have shown that increasing hand hygiene uh, can result in reduced sick days in schools your child may your child's school may allow you to provide your child with personal hand sanitizer and if they do i've just mentioned a couple of points on the slide there so make sure you're using a commercially made and approved hand sanitizer you that has at least 60 percent alcohol and then avoid hand sanitizer that uses technical grade ethanol um, so i've included the link to the health canada warning around the technical grade uh, ethanol uh, and then the last point which isn't on the slide but always important to remember is to make sure that the hand sanitizer is labeled with your child's name Uh, so the next area is physical distancing and the objective of physical distancing is really to reduce the likelihood uh, of, co of a contact that may lead to transmission and this has been a widely used strategy throughout the pandemic uh, during the pandemic and it has been successful uh, so with respect to return to school i think it's really important that we uh, discuss the role of distancing with children of all ages and also students should be informed about how distancing measures have been implemented in the school. Um, so what expected behaviors are in the school environment, uh, how they've used distancing to help support uh, the health and safety of students and teachers. So things like separating the desks. Um, but it's also important to, to discuss that distancing is only one of a bundle of safety measures. So interactions such as playing and socializing is central to child development and shouldn't be completely discouraged, especially when all of the other measures like cohorting, masking, hand hygiene are implemented. <laughs> 
And the last point I, I guess I would make is I've, I've heard uh, of some children expressing anxiety about what to do if children aren't respecting their personal space. So I would just encourage uh, you to talk to your children and develop strategies uh, for those children that have anxiety around that about what to do in those circumstances. Okay, so the last area I wanted to touch on uh, quickly is around masking. And masking is uh, an area where advice has changed over the course of the pandemic and recommendations vary in different jurisdictions. And part of the reason for this variation is weighing the pros and cons um, with a strong consideration of the, the local epidemiology. So on this slide here, um, just highlighting some of the pros and cons. And so we know that face masks can reduce transmission from individuals who are symptomatic and shedding the virus. And I included a, a picture there from the, from the CDC around that. Um, and this is what people refer to as source control. Um, of course, for this to be effective, you need to be wearing the mask and have it covering your mouth and, or, and, and nose for it to be that barrier. Um, and, and source control, and this is, has been a very important strategy. But there are also negative consequences of masking in children. And again, I, I've listed them there, but they include the potential impact on social development and speech and language development. Uh, the difficulty for some children to tolerate the mask and, and potentially lead to distraction and inattention. It also could lead to uh, an increase in behaviors that may increase your risk of infection. So, for example, touching your face. Um, and it can also be hard for teachers and others in the class when they can't read facial expressions to appreciate whether or not the class is engaged. Um, so those are just some of, of the pros and cons of masking, in, in particular in the school environment. And so while many jurisdictions have mandated masks in indoor areas, uh, it is important to acknowledge that there are differences between schools and indoor public settings. So in both scenarios, we, in most areas, and hopefully uh, we can keep it this way, there is a, a low infection or community infection rate. But in schools, there's also uh, the addition of screening to make sure that people don't have symptoms. Um, there's the possibility that younger children may be less likely to transmit the infection. And then there are all the health and safety measures that are being put in place. So the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, on top of the ability to contact trace should a case be identified in the school. So the question really comes down to whether or not the incremental benefit of wearing a mask um, on top of all of these other health and safety measures outweigh the negative consequences. And people weigh these pros and cons differently. And that's why you see variation in the recommendations that are out there and recommendations by jurisdiction. And really a large contributor to uh, this is the local epidemiology. And, and that's what we highlighted in our uh, report is the need to consider what's going on in the community when deciding on uh, some of these masking recommendations and really weighing uh, the pros and cons, acknowledging that masks do provide uh, potentially source control, uh, but also realizing that with all of these other health and safety measures, at, at some stage, the negative consequences may outweigh uh, the incremental benefit from wearing masks. Uh, so just to end, there are several other important considerations uh, that we talk about in the document and schools have considered uh, in order to support the safe return to school. So these are things like cohorting, uh, enhanced environmental cleaning, uh, ventilation considerations that are summarized in the document. Uh, but again, just to emphasize that it's not one specific measure that's going to reduce the risk alone. Uh, it's really the bundle of measures uh, that's important that are uh, that will be important to keep uh, children uh, and staff and, and otherwise safe. Um, and also the importance of keeping community transmission low. Schools are an extension of our community. And if we can keep cases low in the community, it will help to facilitate uh, the safe return and the ongoing opening of schools. So I will end there.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. We appreciate it. And I think uh, we'll uh, answer some questions after this. But first, we have some questions for the audience, a few more poll questions, I believe. So I think, uh, Sarah, you're going to put, ah, there we go. So audience poll question, are you concerned about yourself or your child returning back to school? Scale of one to five, where one is not at all concerned and five is extremely concerned. So we'll go ready, go on if we are ready. So, you know, a large proportion of you are moderately concerned. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's how many of us feel with sending our kids back to school. But hopefully uh, we can talk a little bit about ways to mitigate risk and to improve the, you know, reduce the risk of transmission and things like that as we go tonight. And the next question is, what are you most concerned about? So we'll ask you to please uh, type in some questions into your chat box, into the chat box uh, in the GoToWebinar software, and we will do our best to address some of your concerns and also answer some of your questions. We got a very large number of questions ahead of time. So, so thank you for that if you sent in questions ahead of time. I think this is probably the largest number of questions we got before a webinar so far. We have over 50 questions to answer. So we may not get to everything, but I'm hoping that we cover the, the big things going forward. So with that, uh, Gil, do you want to introduce the uh, panel? Yeah, no, no, we, we've got an amazing... Oh. So if you are worried about how your medications may put you at risk for COVID-19, which IBD medication are you most concerned about? So you can actually select all that apply, but try to select the ones that you're primarily concerned about. All right. So the biologics, uh, interesting. The biologics are the ones that uh, people are primarily concerned about, followed by the immunomodulators. Gil, do you want to speak to that or should we, uh, we can ask the panel, I think. Yeah, no, no. And, and the reason that we wanted to ask these poll questions is because, you know, when Dr. Science um, presented the, the general recommendations, and we'll, we're going to have her back on in, in a second here, um, you know, those recommendations have been designed with the general school population in mind, but the, the audience that we're talking to today are, are is a special audience that, that not only has all the same concerns that every other family has, but on top of that, um, many of our patients are immunocompromised kids who are biologics, um, and we have to start thinking about kind of nuanced differences in relationship to them. And, and that's why, in addition to having Dr. Science here, uh, we've also invited three phenomenal um, panelists. And the, the key thing with our, our panelists is that um, the, the three people I'm about to introduce are all um, members of our uh, COVID IBD task force. So they've been working and meeting with with us in a large group across the country since um, the, uh, since March to talk about um, the impact of COVID and IBD. Um, and, and the first panelist is Dr. Ann Griffiths, who is a professor uh, and the director of the IBD Center at Sick Kids Hospital at the University of Toronto, and, um, and is now a colleague of Eric, who's just moved to Sick Kids Hospital. Um, Eric's previous colleague was Dr. David Mack, who's a pediatric gastroenterologist. Um, at CHEO, at um, uh, the Pediatric Center at the University of, of Ottawa. Um, and, then, and then my colleague and friend, Dr. Reno Pancioni, who's the head of our IBD clinic here at the University of Calgary. And so what we're hoping to do now for, for the next hour is to um, address the issues that Dr. Science had um, put forward, but also to bring in the other panelists to talk a bit about the risks associated with um, um, the medications and, and immunocompromised patients. And, and maybe the first question I have actually for you, Dr. just in follow-up to, to your presentation is, you know, you, you did an amazing job, you and your colleagues coming together. It's such a, I can't even imagine how difficult a task it would have been to put all this information. The audience has to remember, this is a new virus, it's nine months old. So while you can learn from previous viruses and a lot of data was coming out over the last um, nine months, um, 
it's difficult to put together guidelines on something that is brand new that we hadn't seen before in, in that. And when you were developing these guidelines, are there special considerations for the immunocompromised population, particularly children immunocompromised, like patients who have inflammatory bowel disease? What are, what are your thoughts on that on that population, and, and how would you change any of the recommendations uh, in relationship to that population? And then and then I'd be great to hear the other panelists um, talk about that in the context of um, being experts in, in managing um, IBD and those these drugs. Sure. So, so I, I'm happy to start, and then I'd love to turn it over to the panelists for their um, uh, for their opinions. I, I mean, I think the most important thing with the, these recommendations, and really they are meant to be broad recommendations, um, is that people um, sort of understand them and, and know how they can be implemented and how they can be protective. Um, so. You know, I think at a time when data is constantly evolving, having a group like you have together where you're actively monitoring the situation and understanding what the risk factors so you can tailor um, recommendations uh, is really important. Uh, so with our guidelines, we acknowledged the, the, the various groups uh, at that time. Um, and as we've developed the guidance, we haven't found sort of strong signals for increased risk factors uh, in children beyond other respiratory viruses viruses related to COVID-19. So we have been watching it very closely um, to know if there are specific groups that we should uh, say should be treated differently. Um, at this time, we haven't identified that, um, but I'm interested to hear from your group. You have more data uh, specifically uh, with the target audience out there, but I, I would just reinforce that, you know, all of these health and safety measures we put in place uh, apply to, uh, you know, children uh, that don't have immunocompromised conditions and those that do. Uh, and then I would defer to your group around sort of the specific nuance for children with IBD. Yeah, and so uh, Dave, maybe it's actually a, a nice segue into thinking about the, the kids that you're taking care of right now in your pediatric IBD clinic and the questions they're asking around um, coming back to school and being on, on different drugs and how, how, do you, how do you address these issues with, with your patients? Yeah, so the ones I'm really most concerned about are the patients that are getting uh, back on prednisone or starting prednisone, but these are also, you know, the new diagnosis, severe flares, they've been losing weight, they're tired, they're not sleeping at night. I mean, they're just more prone to infections in general. So those are the ones that, that uh, you know, we're, I'm recommending just don't go to school right now. The, the other group that's that's come up uh, a little bit now is, and I think it needs, it may be school to school, but those kids that are that are having a colitis symptomatology and having to go to the bathroom quite a bit. And then it depends a lot on what's happening uh, with the school and their access to bathrooms, because if it's limited or or other things like that, it's another consideration that's just cropped up in the last uh, week. Uh, about what to do for them. So I think those are ones they have to work with the school and if, if there is a limited access or, you know, different procedures around that, they they are going to have trouble going back to school as well. Yeah, and, and just touching on that, the bathroom issue, um, just for the audience, um, I think it was June 4th, we did an entire webinar series uh, or episode on um, bathroom access in, in public, so people going back into the workforce or some kids going back to school mm -hmm. and safety around use of, of bathrooms. And, and that's actually um, a, a fantastic webinar to watch to, to get to, to learn about um, bathroom access and safety. And, and, and Michelle, just wondering if from your perspective, um, using bathrooms as, as as Dave mentioned, for our population, it's it's often that they have to go to the bathroom, they have a, a bowel movement. Sometimes they it, quite a few in a day, even even if their their disease is under control. And if if did your guidelines talk a lot about safety in bathrooms and washrooms and what's happening at schools and how how do what should parents or children going into schools think about in terms of bathroom access and safety while being in the bathroom? Yeah, so I, I think it's a really great point, and it's likely that most schools are going to limit the number of students in, in a washroom at a given point just to try to prevent crowding. So um, those situations, I, I think it would be really important to, uh, you know, 
reach out to the school and discuss uh, situations or, or as Dr. Mack had mentioned, it may be if there is a flare, it, it may not be um, if access to washrooms is going to be an issue that that would be an important consideration. In terms of preventing transmission itself in bathrooms, I mean, I think the most important thing here really goes back to hand hygiene and, and making sure uh, you're washing your hands well um, related to bathroom activities. That's great. And uh, there was a lot of concern uh, from the audience members. We saw that in the poll and, and in the chat box as well, people putting in questions about different medications, different forms of immune suppression, particularly people were worried about things like biologics and immunosuppressants like methotrexate and uh, the thiopurines like azathioprine. Can you review a little bit about what you're telling patients about the different forms of immunosuppression and what your recommendations are if they're on those medicines? Um, yes, uh, certainly. So we've um, had these questions a lot uh, in the clinic all along. And what I like for people to know is, first of all, Ever since the early days of COVID-19, there has been this effort that was highlighted by Gil earlier, the secure IBD registry, where the goal has been to record patients with IBD around the world who do develop COVID illness and then keep track of whether they have a mild illness or a more severe illness. And as Gil mentioned, there have now been 2,200 patients in total registered. And from that, we can try to track factors that might be associated with having a more difficult time with the illness. There have been some other additional registries, I think. There was a very recent systematic review of uh, published cohorts uh, another 1,000 patients that I think were not uh, in the secure IBD registry. So that's sort of the data set that we have to learn from to know whether medications used for IBD influence how sick you might get with it if you developed COVID-19. So the data coming out of those registries is overall reassuring, especially I think for children, adolescents and young adults. And I think it's basically saying that if you're young and your IBD is well controlled, even with these medications, your chances of developing a severe illness if you're exposed to the virus are, are no greater than someone else your age. Um, so that does seem to be reassuring. Now, admittedly, the total number of children and adolescents that have apparently uh, become ill with COVID and who have IBD is quite small. I think we saw a percentage in Canada. This is the total population of Canada where I think Gil showed us data that 11 or 12 percent of Canadians affected were under age 20. And so for the IBD patients in the secure IBD registry, uh, it's a total of 194 people with IBD under 20 who have been registered as having developed uh, this SARS-CoV-2 illness. Now, it's a huge majority of them did not go into hospital. I think five or six percent were hospitalized and less than one percent uh, in uh, ICU. So mirroring what's been seen in the general population that the greatest risk factors for be having a really serious illness is advanced age and other comorbidities, uh, diabetes, heart disease, maybe obesity. Um, so we think that we can reassure our patients. Um, 
as you all know, uh, IBD is a spectrum, but I think fortunately the average child or teenager with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis these days is for the most part under good control. If it's someone, and Dr. Mack alluded to this, where um, let's say the colitis is active and uh, is requiring high dose steroids uh, to try to control it, then that is one group of patients where um, you would be advised to uh, stay home from school until things are under good control. No, that's, that's great. That's the general advice we give. Yeah. And, and Remo, I think like roughly 10% of our audience are teachers. Um, and I'm just curious for your perspective on adults with IBD who are teaching or working in schools. What are you, what are you telling them in your clinic? How is it different from our, our pediatric colleagues? Oh, you might be uh, muted. Oh, there we go. I was lock muted. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's an important consideration. Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions from our teachers that are on uh, sort of uh, medical therapy, including immunosuppressive therapy and biologics. And in general, um, as already outlined by Anne, and if we look at sort of the secure IBD registries and other, and not only in inflammatory bowel disease, but in other immune mediated diseases where um, these drugs are also used. Um, all of that data, uh, irrespective of disease state, um, is all pointed in the same direction, which is reassuring. Meaning that the two considerations I think that the audience may have is number one is, is there an increased risk that I'm actually gonna contract the virus, which is the first step. And epidemiological studies out of Europe, where you look at a big, say, IBD population and then the bigger population around it, show that contracting the virus, the rate of getting infected, is exactly the same with chronic diseases, irrespective of medication, um, aside from potentially steroids. But that's just from contracting the disease. Once you've contracted the disease, then the question is, you know, if I did get the disease, was am I going to have a poorer outcome? And I and I agree exactly with what Ann said. The data suggests that aside from prednisone, which may be associated with a slightly increased risk of having a poor outcome, and that's why I think the recommendations from CCC are, you know, once you're on prednisone and you fit even into a medium risk group, that sort of pushes your risk a bit higher, especially if you're in higher doses of prednisone. But biologics and immunosuppressants, it doesn't seem to increase your risk of poor outcomes as long as you don't have another comorbidity and as long as you're not in that high risk group related to age. So most of our teachers, as you had outlined, Gil, sit between that 25 to hopefully 65 year uh, age group and um, they should be uh, fine teaching in the schools right now. And Michelle, just to, if all for teachers who are teaching at school, if they have IBD, they're on a biologic or immunocompromised, what protection should they be doing to protect them from a class of 20 plus kids that, um, um, that I'm sure they're giving infections all the time, but, but are potentially at risk for COVID? Yeah, so again, a lot of the health and safety measures have been designed to, to help um, prevent that. So, it, you know, hand hygiene continues to be very important um, and also attention to, uh, we all do it and I've noticed it more on these Zoom calls touching your face. So uh, the, the more people can get used to not putting their hands near their face for people that bite their nails, really bad habit to have at this time, try to break that habit. Um, the physical distancing is, is important to the extent that teachers can uh, physically distance. Obviously, with younger ages, that's a little bit harder, but that's where wearing the appropriate um, personal protective equipment. So my understanding is in most areas, masks uh, are required for, for teachers. I know specifically in Ontario, teachers will be wearing masks. And, and eye protection can, can add an extra layer of protection for those really close uh, 
prolonged contact, the uh, eye protection prevents droplets from going in the mucous membranes in your eyes. So those are, are extra strategies, but really just uh, being aware of how the virus is transmitted and knowing the ways that you can protect yourself with um, what I've discussed is... Uh, and Michelle, just to clarify, in terms of eye protection, would you recommend a face shield or are glasses sufficient? How? So, you know, in, in the healthcare setting, we always say glasses don't provide full protection because there's the areas, that, you know, around the glasses. So, um, technically, if you're wearing a face shield for the purposes of personal protective equipment, a, a face shield which uh, protects the eyes it provides better protection than wearing glasses alone. Michelle, there's a lot of there's some questions about um, you know controversial topic I guess, but a lot of schools are not able to guarantee uh, the two meter physical distancing. What are your do your recommendations change for for students in that case? Should parents be sending their kids back to school if they the schools can't guarantee uh, staying six feet apart? Uh, so, again, it comes down to the bundle of measures that's put in place. So, physical distancing is one of those measures. Um, you know, so I think it also, people need to consider the local epidemiology and how likely it is that COVID is being brought into the school. So, the, the local epidemiology and all of the other measures that, that are being put into place, it, it really depends on the local context and in, in where you are. Physical distancing is one measure. In younger kids, it's a lot harder to maintain physical distancing in a JKSK class, and that's where strategies like cohorting and having small, smaller cohorts of students become an important strategy. So, there's lots of different ways to look at it um, in areas where you can't have physical distancing. Some places are mandating masks. So, again, I would try not to focus on, on one particular measure, but really the bundle and, and look at what has been implemented in the school and then make decisions around that. And I think one thing you have strong consideration for the local epidemiology. I think that's probably the most important take home point. If things are controlled and low in the community, then it's less likely that there will be issues in schools. I think the other take home point that you made earlier, probably even more important for parents to consider, is if your child has any symptoms at all, they should not be going to school, right? That's probably the number one way that we're going to be able to control this. And if your child has any symptoms, they should be tested and family members should be going to school until we know that they're negative as well, I believe, right? So let's let's talk about family members a little bit. Uh, certainly a question that I've gotten in the clinic quite a bit was, you know, uh, a child recently diagnosed, maybe on steroids, severe active inflammation, should their siblings be going to school? I'll let anybody, maybe Dave, do you wanna answer that one? How are you answering that to patients? Well, I think uh, that comes into what we just heard from Dr. Science. It's the other the other measures that are in place. So I don't necessarily think the other uh, kids need to stay home. But if they are going to school, then then when they do come home, wash their hands and 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 do the other uh, preventative measures. Uh, if they are um, sick, then they definitely should stay away from their sibling. Uh, um, so not necessarily the other siblings uh, don't go to school if, if there's a sick kid at home is what I'm recommending right now. So, so I guess I'll ask the pediatricians because I do think it's a, it, it's a maybe follow up and it's, it's relative. Obviously, if they're in that high risk group, the question that I would probably recommend you know, obviously that they would go to school per se. Um, I wouldn't sort of keep the the sibs at home. But the question is, when the sibs come home, what other things can you put in place within your, including the the, the social distancing, right? Which which is a little bit difficult, not only with siblings but with family members. And 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 Gil, I think asked me to talk about you know high risk groups like grandparents, right? And so I think what Michelle has said here is very, very important from the perspective of um, this social interaction, including our seniors, right? So, you know, seniors want to see their grandchildren, right? And if their grandchildren are going to school, you don't want to completely isolate them from their grandchildren for the next six months. So the local epidemiology and, you know, having both of them mask at the same time 
and keeping them, you know, they can see them, but maybe they, you know, it shouldn't be hugs and kisses and everything. Those I think are, are very, very important because we do have some, you know, mental health wellness issues uh, to also consider here. And so Michelle, how about that, right? Like we've defined in our, you know, you know, our sort of over the age of 65 in adults is, is, is a risk factor probably, but now we have kids going to school and then coming back, can they see their grandparents and what should they be doing? Yeah, so I, I feel like I say this a lot, but it really does depend on what's happening uh, locally and then personal decisions within the family weighing the, the risks and benefits of those interactions. Um, and again, as you mentioned, there are a number of, of things you can do in those interactions to reduce the risk of of transmission and still allow some of that interaction. Uh, obviously that becomes more complicated in multi-generational homes and when grandparents are actually living with family members and, and those are uh, you know different circumstances and, and considerations people have to take into um, account when they're making these decisions about return to school. It's, it, it's certainly a, a challenging uh, a challenging area and hard decisions for families. But um, again, what's going on in the community is an important predictor of what, what, can, what can happen. And then there's all of these measures that you can put in place to help reduce the risk, um, but acknowledging that it won't uh, ever eliminate the risk entirely. And, and you know, there's a question from the audience around um, surgery. And if my child is facing surgery, is it is it safe to go to school or should we do online um, and learning? And I'm curious to get um, the panel's perspective on that. And maybe Anna, I'll start with you to get a sense of what is the impact of surgery in making the decision? And then maybe a broader question for the, the larger audience or what, what are settings where you might tell uh, a family, you know, for this semester, maybe the best thing to do is do online learning, you know, and then we'll revisit things in January of 2021. Um, wh what are the settings where where online learning might actually make sense for for some families with with IBD, um, and um, and and which would somebody with having an impending surgery coming up is is that a setting where where it might make sense? I think uh, I think you're asking me. Yeah, to yeah. But then, and then I'm yeah. yeah. Get everyone's perspective. Um, so I guess if it's a child with IBD who has a planned surgery coming up. Uh, the most common circumstances would be a operation for Crohn's disease uh, in a patient who presumably is fairly stable but maybe has a narrowed part that's going to be removed or else uh, in colitis uh, if it's an elective surgery it could be because the colitis has been chronically active so I think um, probably two parts of the question are, you know, is that child at any greater risk of getting sicker if they were exposed to the virus? And if it's a setting of sort of poorly controlled colitis, then maybe they are. If it's a bit more burnt out, Crohn's disease that's being operated on, then probably not. Um, but the other side of the picture, I guess, is um, I think when you're looking ahead to surgery in any circumstance, you, you want to go into the surgery healthy and not harboring a virus, I guess. So if your surgery is planned sort of next week, uh, I mean, it makes reasonable sense to stay home between now and the date next week, but it's for the reason of um, not wanting to acquire the virus, I guess, and take it with you into the hospital. Um, I'm not sure if, if those two parts to that answer, uh, to that question, give the answer they were looking for. So, you know, I mean, it's one of the things we've talked a lot about going back to school, but but definitely online is is an option. I know in, in Calgary, 
um, the options that the school boards offered, you know, every family to, to choose whether they had IBD or not, not or the, um, was you can come in class or there was an online option. But they, they, they asked you to make a decision kind of in August so they could do planning for those schools so they would know how many students and then how many teachers they would need and how they would redistribute the classes depending on the proportion of the class that went to school versus decided to do online teaching and then have developed, you know, strong online programs to support that homeschool uh, approach. Now, again, it's not the same level of, of teaching that you would get in, in class. And of course, the parents have to help in, the, in those scenarios. Um, but those options are, and, and, and just curious for, for the rest of the panels, uh, scenarios where you might say, you know what, Maybe taking that option is, is not a bad idea, particularly in the, the, the way that, at least in Calgary, it was set up was you had to make a decision for September and then, you, then you're in that cohort, you're either in person or you're online, and then you have an opt-in or out um, to switch kind of in the second semester in the beginning of 2021. So are, are, there, are there other scenarios where, where you think that it, it may be a, a, an idea just to consider online teaching? And, and just to be for, for any of the panel members. Well, I mean, I'm happy to sort of talk about that a little bit. And I think there's the disease part of it where um, I think we've already gone through. You know, if you have uncontrolled disease, um, sorry, and you might have uncontrolled disease for a period of time, even leading up to sort of making that decision, I think the more uncertainty on how stable the child is, the more that you might want to lean to sort of online learning. Um, and then I think that, you know, um, not that uh, I'm not a psychologist, but then I think you need to really think about the child and your family and what the concerns are, um, because we know that within our patients, whether you're an adult or a child, there I think that there is a spectrum of personalities and how they, w w with respect to even anxiety, et cetera, right? And I think forcing children into a situation where they've expressed that they're not comfortable probably isn't healthy for them overall. So I think that individual families need to look again at their family situation, what's possible, the child and their disease. So I don't think it's the disease in isolation that I would think about making a recommendation. It would be the knowledge of all of those things going forward. I want to pick up on that thread actually and, and ask Anne, um, because I know we had rounds this morning with a psychologist and a psychiatrist and all our nurses. What are you seeing in your patients since COVID hit in terms of their uh, mental health and psychosocial well-being? Are you noticing any trends in, in kids? Well, I think um, there, there are uh, some children where it's certainly recognized that they are more anxious. Um, I think among the children where it's recognized, it, it's probably most often where they were recognized even before as having um, a tendency to anxiety. What, I, what I'm less sure of, and um, I think it applies uh, to children in general and perhaps particularly young children, uh, I think, and I, Michelle may have some comments, I, I don't know whether they um, have anxiety that we don't really know about because they're not able to verbalize it as much. Um, but certainly for our IBD patients, and you know, most of them are older, not that many really small children, um, yes, uh, it is um, a reason for anxiety. Uh, it's become most obvious, I would say, among those where even before they were recognized to have uh, anxious temperaments. That's my take. Yeah, and I certainly noticed that in, in my patients that, you know, the majority of children did well with e-learning and did well staying at home uh, through the, the time of isolation, but there were a proportion of patients who did not do as well. And uh, they may have been at risk for mental health issues before, but suffered with anxiety and depression as a result of the isolation. And then I had patients who actually did better when they stayed home. Uh, and a lot of those patients were the ones that were that had anxiety related to going to school in the first place, and they tended to do well when they were home. Oh, there's some echo there. Um, so I think you get a whole spectrum of people that, you know, of kids who, who handle this differently. 
And so I think that's sort of the message for parents that we're sending is it's a very individual choice, right? It really is, while on the whole, it's best for kids to be in school for the social development and the educational benefits, every child is different. And I think we have to consider that to be the case. Um, a question came up again, and I want to, I think we should emphasize because we spoke about siblings. So if a child has active Crohn's, for example, uh, or is on steroids, we had talked about that the siblings, you know, at the moment, we're still recommending that the siblings go to school, but just be careful when they come home. So I guess two paired questions is, how do they be careful when they come home? What do they do? And then uh, the will, the, the other question that was asked by one of the audience members was, what if an adult has active Crohn's? Should that adult send their kids to school? So maybe we'll start with Remo. What do you tell adults with Crohn's? Should they let their kids go to school? Crohn's, active Crohn's on steroids, let's say. Yeah, so again, um, I would say that the child could go to school, but you need to use the rest of the public health measures that were outlined uh, by Michelle uh, when, when the child comes home. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't change that recommendation um, because then you're getting into sort of concepts of really shielding uh, individuals, uh, right? And so, and then, you know, what I, I, would, I may change that consideration based on, you know, the epidemiology. Obviously, if there's five cases in the school that your child is going to and you have active Crohn's disease, my recommendation would be somewhat different. Uh, right. But in general, I think that, um, you know, my recommendations is it would be that the child could go to school. And again, everything that we're talking about, I think, are learning opportunities for within families on how to deal with this, which I think is very, very uh, important. And one of the anxieties that notwithstanding what Michelle said is one of the anxieties is that you can't control the behavior within a school. You may be able to change control what's happening with your child. Um, so it's the same thing that applies within the household is control what you can within the household if you're concerned and the child is coming back. And Michelle, um, what Michelle, would you uh, ask when, when the child comes back? back? What, uh, what should the family do to sort of clear things as they come through the door? Yeah, so, so good question. Can you hear me? I was having some connection issues. Is all okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so, yeah, we can hear you. We've certainly been asked this quite a bit, um, you know, should children change their clothes when they come home from school, sort of those sort of questions, what measures. Um, and, you know, really it comes down to uh, a question around fomite transmission and the likelihood that a child would have infectious virus on them and on their clothes at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you've heard that some hospital staff do this, uh, but important to keep in mind that it's a different environment in the hospital compared to schools. Healthcare workers are seeing sick, symptomatic patients potentially with COVID-19. So there's a stronger rationale to uh, potentially change clothes in that scenario. In the school, as, as we've talked about, there are really several layers of protection. So first, if community transmission is low, the likelihood that a child um, with infection uh, is in the school is lower. Uh, second, we have the fact that symptomatic children shouldn't be coming to school, so that should reduce the environmental contamination. And then there's all the um, other health and safety measures, uh, in addition to uh, the fact that fomite transmission is not considered a uh, significant risk, uh, a significant mode of transmission. Uh, so overall, with the current epidemiology, I would say the things like changing the children's clothes and stuff when they come home from school isn't really necessary. Uh, but again, these are some personal uh, decisions and it depends on the risk tolerance and the situation in the household. Other things that would be really important would just if, if one of the siblings is going to school uh, again hand hygiene monitoring them for any signs or symptoms um, being aware of what's going on uh, the class or the school would notify you if the child was exposed um, so so just keeping up to date on those things and um, uh, those would be the main things at home and Michelle, what's the, what did the, on the comment that you just made let, let's say one of the children's classmates is COVID positive and public health and content. What would a family expect in that scenario to happen? Uh, so, sorry, in the events that... Uh, one of their classmates was to, does become COVID positive. So they, they themselves aren't COVID positive, but one of their classmates is. What, what do you think would happen? What would a family expect to happen in that scenario when, once they're kind of contacted and said, oh, one of their classmates uh, tested positive with COVID? 
Yeah, so if, if a case is identified in the school, then public health would get involved and work with the school to identify any close contacts of that person. Um, and those close contacts would be asked to self-isolate and monitor for symptoms. So in the case, the child that was in the, the class would likely be part of that cohort and would be considered a close contact, and that child would need to stay home uh, for the, the period of time recommended by the, the public health. And, and Dave, just as a follow-up to that, if if you if you're now caring for that that child who's now being asked to home isolate for 14 days, and they're on a biologic, what what would you recommend to do in the context of their of their care? Well, not much. Uh, you know, if they're coming up to their next infusion, uh, you may want to just put that off a couple of weeks. But uh, we've had a kid who, uh, you know, inadvertently the next day following an infusion of their biologic uh, tested positive. Uh, he was essentially asymptomatic, really nothing went on. Um, so, I mean, we've had those issues come up, um, but so I think if, if, if you're talking about a healthy, stable kid who's getting his regular biologics or other medicines and, and uh, the school says, listen, you've had a contact, uh, really, we're, if there's no increased risk of him catching it or no increased risk of, of him getting worse, then he should just follow the advice of public health that any kid would have. Now, if, if I think it changes if you have a kid if, that is staying home who's been really sick, you know, on the prednisone, lost weight, and, you know, that, that high risk group, then that, that changes a bit, you know, because if the kid comes home, that their sibling comes home with this exposure, then I think you you know you you'd want to isolate the sick patient from the sibling, if it's possible. If they have separate bathrooms, that they shouldn't be sharing toothbrushes or glasses and 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 all those things. So I think it's it's you know if you're talking a healthy sibling with a sick patient at home, it's far different than a healthy healthy Crohn's patient who's, you know, been on a biologic infusions as stable and healthy as any kid. Uh, uh, I, sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, I was just going to say we're coming to the end of time and it's, there was two questions I think that we should probably address uh, because it's questions about our recommendations. I mean, the first is that our recommendations are that patients with moderate to severe malnutrition should probably not be going to school, going to large areas with lots of people. What do we define as moderate to severe malnutrition? Uh, maybe Anne, I'll throw that to you. I th so we, we did have this discussion um, amongst the task force uh, a few months ago. Um, and, and I think what's really worrying is malnutrition that's come about uh, as a result of active inflammatory disease and neither the nutritional status nor the inflammation have yet been treated. I mean, that, that's the type of patient you worry about. There are a lot of um, skinny kids, right? And uh, a, a lot of parents who think their, their kids are low weight, and they are low weight, but I don't think that per se, um, you know, most of them are running around obviously very healthy. Um, so, and I think we came up with this recommendation at the task force as well, that there needs to be some, I think, professional input into whether um, the child's current status of nutrition and disease control does or doesn't um, put them at greater risk. Yeah, no, that's great. And then Remo, maybe last question. Um, how do you tell the difference between gut inflammation from the IBD and symptoms of COVID-19? There's a lot of overlap there, isn't there? Yeah, I, I mean, there there's overlap, but um, it's the same thing that I, meaning that you could get abdominal pain and diarrhea, but I, I've always subscribed to this notion that IBD patients usually are what I call true to their flair, meaning that, um, you know, if your nose twitches and your left toe tingles and then you have a flare of disease, most of your flares are going to look the same. If they feel or look different, 
then you should think about you should think about COVID or some other sort of uh, something else. Um, you know, in general, if you're having a flare, though, we're just testing everyone for COVID-19 to exclude it. Yeah, no, I think, and that's the key is if you're worried, if these are new symptoms, you weren't in a flare yesterday, you are today, and there's COVID in the community, which there is, it's worth getting tested. Absolutely. All right. Any final comments? Maybe, Michelle, do you have any final words on, on our recommendations, what your thoughts are, where we should go from here? Um, so I, I guess I would just uh, re-emphasize the importance of, you know, sticking with the public health guidance, making sure we're following the recommendations to keep transmission low in the community, because that will really help facilitate the safe opening and keeping schools open as long as possible. Um, and, and that there has, there has been a lot of success with school openings in areas where there's low community transmission and these health and safety measures are in place. Great. Yeah, the comment that I would just want to uh, end with, in addition to thanking all the panelists, and especially Mich Michelle, I know coming out this evening and giving such a wonderful presentation and answering these really complicated questions. And the, the comment I just wanted to end with is, um, you know, our task force, we're, we're meeting on a regular basis because one of the things that's on our radar is exactly what you've kind of emphasized throughout this talk is what is the epidemiology of the virus in different regions across the country. Um, and if there's low transmission rates, then the likelihood of acquiring the virus when you go to school is going to be low. But we recognize that these transmissions may, may change over time as we head into winter and things like that. And so we're, we as an organization are going to constantly be looking at the geographic variation, the epidemiology of the disease. And if we start seeing things are different, we start learning more about what the impact of COVID is on IBD, we're going to be coming back with these webinars to give everyone the information. On, and, and if we need to make those changes, we'll try to communicate that to you as, as quickly as we, as we learn that. Yeah. So with that, I'd like to thank all the panelists for joining us tonight. Um, uh, Dr. Griffiths, Dr. Science, Dr. Mack, and Dr. Panaccioni, thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate it. I want to thank the audience for the amazing questions, wonderful questions. Um, I don't think we have any more poll questions, but please do give us feedback and let us know how we did today and your your sort of feedback as well as suggestions for future topics will influence what we choose to do next month uh, and in future webinars as well. And then I wanted to uh, make another plea. This was what I did after every webinar uh, in the spring, but I think we need to continue to emphasize that very clearly health charities, and you probably read about it in the news, health charities are struggling greatly to raise funds in an era where we can't hold galas, you can't hold parties, educational events are all online and so i wanted to emphasize that please please do uh, consider donating if you consider these these webinars useful uh, to crohn's and colitis canada uh, we are the largest non-governmental funder of ibd research in canada and therefore it's really important that we get money to the organization so that research into ibd and even ibd and covid 19 continues to happen the gutsy walks already happen but you can donate at gutsywalk.ca if you appreciate these webinars please consider donating to the team gill and eric's ibd what is it? gill and eric's covid ibd webinars we're actually if you scroll down from that page you'll see we're the number eight top rate top fundraising group fundraising team for the gutsy walk we've raised over fifteen thousand dollars for crohn's and colitis canada so far and I'm hoping that's just the tip of the iceberg. If these webinars continue and you, you appreciate them, please, please, please consider donating whatever you can to Crohn's and Colitis Canada at gutsywalk.ca. Uh, and with that, uh, as the slide said earlier, I want to thank, as usual, frontline workers. And that's everybody who's out there working and helping people and trying to make life better. Uh, in particular, I think we need to thank people like Dr. Like Dr. Science, uh, the infectious disease experts, the public health experts, who are out there and have made it possible for us to reopen the economy and now as of this week in most places reopen schools across Canada to allow our children to get educated and to have socially interact and to end as best as we can the social isolation that they were feeling in the spring so thank you all for all the work that you do and uh, thank you to Crohn's and Colitis Canada and I hope to see you again very soon in about a month is the next one planned thanks